Bibles, if you'd open with me now to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24 this morning. And I want to encourage you, um, as you're turning there, just as a reminder, if, if you have a cell phone, most of us do, if you wouldn't mind silencing that, I'd really appreciate it. Had a couple of alarms go off last uh, service. And, and the reason why I say that is this is kind of a, a section of Scripture that um, demands not only clear exposition, but also expositional listening and the attention to what we're going to consider today. And I'll do my best to make that which is complex, clear, and discernible. That is always my prayer when, when we come together. But I also would like to mention to you, no doubt that you are aware of what has transpired in the last 24 hours as Israel is now under and has been under attack by Iran sending hundreds of suicide drones and missiles into cities there in Israel. It's interesting because Iran so often has attacked Israel through other nations, supplying them, supporting them. And for the first time, we see them now um, attacking them. And this has always been their desire. They haven't hidden their agenda for years about what they've desired to do to Israel But I was thinking about Zechariah chapter 12, verse 3, where the prophet declared, it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples, and all who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all the nations of the earth are gathered against it. There is coming a day, the Bible makes it clear, when all the nations of the earth are going to turn against Israel. I think that's just a matter of time. But this is significant, and I was thinking of what Israel's response was, reading in the Jerusalem Post today, that they are preparing for a response, which is, if you know anything about the military of Israel, it's, it's, um, it's very serious, this kind of response, and what this will bring about. The question now becomes, will Russia get involved? Uh, That's an interesting scenario on, based upon biblical prophecy, Ezekiel 38. What's, what's going to happen? I don't know. I'm, I'm not fearful. I'm just aware, and hopefully you're watching. We do not need to be fearful. We know that these things are going to transpire. The Lord told us that they would, but he also gives a warning to those nations those nations that bless the nation of Israel and those nations that curse the nation of Israel. Also very concerning is the response of our own president today uh, in telling uh, the prime minister of Israel that um, I read the words, take the win and don't retaliate, whatever that means. I don't know that he really knows what he's saying when he says it anyway, but (laughs) it's just concerning um, what our position is going to be because these are our allies. And if we don't stand with Israel... um, that, that's a dangerous thing for us as a nation based, again, upon Scripture. So we're aware of these are exciting times to be living in and how appropriate to be in the Olivet Discourse at a time like this. So Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 15, if you would follow along with me as we read from the Scriptures. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place... Whoever reads, let him understand. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant, to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Shall we pray? Father, this morning we do come before you and we lift up the nation of Israel. You have encouraged us, exhorted us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Lord, we pray that you would give the leadership their wisdom on how to respond. We pray for their hostages to be released as more nations seems to be turning their artillery against Israel. Lord, we we know that your word says these things are happening. Where we are in the timeline prophetically, uh, Lord, we're closer than we've ever been. That we know for sure. And so I pray you'd speak to us now as we consider your word and what you told us in advance. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In his final days before his death on the cross, Jesus made several profound statements, one of which had to do with the nation of Israel and also his second coming. Now, the disciples had pointed out 
how magnificent the building of the temple was. Jesus responded prophetically by stating that the temple that they were admiring would be destroyed and not one stone would be left upon another. Amazed and astonished by his claim, the disciples questioned Jesus and they asked him, when would these things be? That is the destruction of the temple. Secondly, what would be the signs indicating that these things were about to take place? And also, what would be the ultimate sign of his coming and the end of the age? Keep in mind that the disciples were Jewish men asking about the nation of Israel and the Lord's return. And it was there on the Mount of Olives that Jesus presented clear signs to look for. Matthew points out that Jesus spoke of these signs as the beginning of sorrows that were similar to birth pains, that they would increase with more intensity and frequency as the second coming of Christ drew near. And those signs included religious deception, war and destruction, global devastation, and persecution. And these signs, as we mentioned last time we were together, have always been part of man's existence. However, they have not lessened or weakened, but they have increased and strengthened. In fact, I believe that it is safe to say that at this time in human history, each of the signs that Jesus pointed to are at an all-time high. But of all of those signs that will point to the second coming, there is one that stands out above them all that Jesus refers to here in verse 15. Let's read it again. Therefore, when you see, here's the sign, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Jesus looks back to a prophetic passage in Daniel chapter 9. And within that chapter... The prophet Daniel was given a specific prophecy that pointed to the nation of Israel. And this prophecy is referred to as the 70 weeks of Daniel. Now in Daniel's day, Israel refused to obey the Lord. They had rejected the warnings of the prophets. They turned to idolatry. Also, the Lord had instructed them to only work the land for six years. And in the seventh year, they were not to work the land, but to give it a sabbatical rest. However, for 490 years, Israel refused to comply with God's law. And therefore the consequences was that they would be carried away into captivity in Babylon for 70 years. This would cure them of their idolatry and it would give the land the rest that it had been denied. Now, when Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians came to Israel, they destroyed Jerusalem, they destroyed the temple, and they displaced the people. And it appeared that all hope of ever being a nation again was lost. Yet in the midst of the darkened days of Babylonian captivity, the Lord spoke to his prophet Daniel, one of the most significant prophetic passages in the entire Bible. As the ninth chapter of Daniel opens, Daniel is an older man. He's probably in his 80s. Israel is probably in the 68th of the 70 years of captivity. And Daniel began to read the words of Jeremiah he begins a scriptural investigation. And as he was reading the words of Jeremiah, he began to realize that they were getting closer to the end of their captivity. For example, in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 10, Jeremiah prophesied and said, for thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. So Daniel reads that and he realizes it's almost been 70 years. We're, we're getting ready to go back. And so after he had this scriptural investigation, what Daniel does next is he enters into sincere intercession on behalf of the nation. He begins to pray. Daniel prepared his heart to seek the Lord. And in prayer, 
He covered himself in sackcloth and ashes. He was fasting. He was praying. And he was confessing the sins of the nation. And he made no excuses. He admitted that the nation was in the condition that it was in because of the decisions that they had made. And he included himself. He also said there was no excuses. It wasn't anybody else's fault except their own. And he cried out for forgiveness, appealing to the mercy of God. And he asked God to hear, to act, and not to delay his response. Well, as Daniel continued to pray, he received an angelic visitation. The angel Gabriel was sent to Daniel. And while Daniel was in prayer, he had a vision of the angel Gabriel and informing him that he had come to reveal to Daniel a particular prophecy. He told him that he was loved and that he was about to help him understand the vision. The 70 weeks of Daniel, this prophecy he was given, really emphasized Jesus Christ. I mean, that was the main emphasis. But if I were to summarize the 70 weeks of Daniel, I would do it this way. First of all, it talked about the first coming of Jesus. Second, the crucifixion of Jesus. Third, a counterfeit Jesus. And ultimately, the coming kingdom of Jesus. That's how you could summarize the 70 weeks of Daniel. But it says in Daniel that 70 weeks were determined for the nation of Israel. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. 70 weeks are determined for the nation. Listen carefully. A week in this prophecy equals one seven-year period. One week equals seven years. Daniel was told by Gabriel that there are 70 seven-year periods of time that are allotted for God's plan for the nation of Israel. 70 times seven is 490 years. 490 years are determined for God's dealing with the nation of Israel. Now listen carefully. As you go back and you look at the prophecy in Daniel chapter nine, what you will discover is that 69 of those seven year periods have already been fulfilled. They're already done. They've already happened. Which tells us that there is one final week or one final seven year period as it relates to God's plan for the nation of Israel. And it would seem where we are right now is between the 69th and the 70th year in this interim of time, this pause, if you would. And the clearest indication is so obvious here. You remember that Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse seven, alas, for that day is great so that none is like it, even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. There is one final seven-year period. And what is that seven-year period called? The tribulation period. And the purpose of the tribulation period is twofold. One, it is to judge a Christ-rejecting world. Second, it is to draw the nation of Israel back to her Messiah. And it is during the tribulation period, that final seven years, the 70th week of Daniel, that there will be a counterfeit Christ. And that brings us to the abomination that brings desolation that Jesus referred to. Daniel chapter nine, verse 27, it reads this way. Then he, that is speaking of this false Christ that is coming. He shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. One week equals? Got it. One week. But in the middle of the week, which would be three and a half years into the seven years, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Here Daniel was informed that a covenant would be made with the nation of Israel. There is a prince who is to come, a counterfeit Christ, the Antichrist. Folks, listen. Once the rapture of the church happens, the seven-year tribulation period begins. 
the 70th week now begins. The 70th week of Daniel. And during that time, the Antichrist will come onto the scene. And he will have answers for the world. He will solve the Middle East crisis that has gone on forever. He will also help the Jews rebuild their temple, which by the way is a desire that they have even at the present time. The Bible says that this Antichrist, he's also referred to as the little horn in Daniel 7, the king of fierce countenance in Daniel chapter 8, the prince that shall come, Daniel chapter 9, the willful king, Daniel chapter 11, the one who comes in his own name, John chapter 5 verse 43, the son of perdition, the man of sin, the lawless one, and Revelation 13 simply calls him the beast. And the Bible tells us that he will be given... His power from the devil himself. He will be the devil incarnate. And he will have power from the devil. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul tells us concerning him. The apostle Paul said, the coming of the lawless one, this antichrist, it's according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. This counterfeit Christ will be given complete authority by the rest of the nations and the world will follow him and he'll establish this peace agreement with the nation of Israel, a seven year, a covenant of one week or seven years. They rebuild their temple in that first three and a half years. It's set up. But something happens in the middle of that covenant, in the middle of the seven years, three and a half years in, which is called the abomination, which brings about desolation. This is not the only time that Daniel mentions this. He also mentions it in Daniel chapter 11, in verse 31. And it says this, and the forces shall be mustered by him. They shall defile the sanctuary, the fortress. They shall take away the daily sacrifice and place their abomination of desolation. He mentions it again in Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. So again, Daniel is told there is coming a day when there is a prince that is to come. He's going to establish a covenant with the nation of Israel. In the middle of that covenant, he's going to break his agreement and he's going to establish there in the temple, the holy place, the abomination which brings about desolation. What is this? I believe Paul refers to it. Again, 2 Thessalonians Chapter two this time, verse three and four, he says this, let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Here he is. He opposes and he exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. The Antichrist allows the Jewish people to rebuild their temple. They're sacrificing. Everything seems good. And then he comes in and says, by the way, everything's changing from this day forward. From now on, I am God. Everyone worships me. There will be a false prophet. There will be an image of the beast. He suffers suffers some mortal wound, the Bible tells us in Revelation, and somehow recovers a resurrection, as it were. And he demands that everybody worships him and worships the image. That is the abomination which brings about desolation. And from that three and a half year period to the end of the seven years ushers in what is called the great tribulation. Now the tribulation is already intense. If you read Revelation chapter six through 19, as the seal judgments are are broken and then you go to the, the, the trumpet judgments and then you go to the bowl judgments, but you get to the great tribulation period and things begin to unravel like you've never seen before. And the nations of the world are gonna surround Jerusalem. The Jews will be forced to flee from the wrath to come. Their eyes will be open. They'll realize that this really isn't their Messiah that they thought that he was. And he will turn on them and seek to destroy them. And the greatest part of the tribulation is the last part, that three and a half years. Now this may seem strange to some, to think about one person being empowered with all the power of the nation and and, uh, this globalistic agenda. But folks, listen, 
if you look around the world today and you see those individuals who are seeking to promote this, this, this is a desire of many nations, a one world government, a one world currency, a one world religion of coexistence, a move toward globalism. This, this is all around us right now at the present time. And it's only escalating. And, and if you don't see it, you may not be aware of things that are happening on the world stage, but this is a very real thing. But there is something that stands in the way of globalism. There is something that stands in the way of, of this agenda being completely uh, rolled out. And that is a system of absolutes. There is a system of absolutes that is presently alive and well on the earth, and that's the church. The church is standing in the way of these things just, just coming. But when the church is removed, there is no stopping this. It's all there. It's prepared. It's just a matter of time. So the abomination that brings about desolation, spoken by Daniel, mentioned by Paul, referred to by Jesus, takes place in the middle of the seven-year tribulation the 70th week of Daniel. And when it does, at the end of the last three and a half years, the Messiah will come in his second coming. What's the sign of your coming? When you see this, when you see this happen, know this, he's coming at the end. You can mark it. Three and a half years, he's gonna show up based upon what Daniel prophesied. And when that happens, Jesus now exhorts the disciples in light of coming future events what the Jews are supposed to do. They have to run for their lives. It says, look here in verse 16, then, that is when this happens, this abomination that brings about desolation, what, what, what then? Those who are in Judea need to flee to the mountains. Many people believe that the Jews will hide in the area known as Petra. For some of you who are with us on our last tour, we went to Petra. This will be one of the places that they run to and flee and hide as the Antichrist is opposed to them and the Lord will be helping to defend them. But it says also in verse 17, let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house and let him who's in the field not go back to get his clothes. And woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. And why is that? Because there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor shall ever be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. The reason why the Jews are going to have to flee is because the Antichrist is going to be oppressing them and seeking to destroy them. Revelation chapter 12 actually describes the attack of the devil against the Jewish people. He has always sought to annihilate them, to wipe them out. This has been since the very beginning of their existence and he has not succeeded and here they will be running for their lives. And Jesus says there is going to be unprecedented tribulation or great tribulation that has never been seen. And then in verse 22, he says, and if it weren't for those days being shortened, that is, if it went beyond seven years, no one would survive. But those days are shortened with the second coming of Christ or else, or else nobody would make it at all because of the devastation that will unfold upon this planet as the wrath of the lamb is being poured out in the midst of the confusion, as people are running, now they, they, they realize they've been deceived and they're fleeing and they're going in every direction. Jesus gives yet another warning concerning deception. In verse 23, then if anyone says to you, when this happens and they're running and you're going in every direction, then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ or there, do not believe it. For false Christ." And false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. In the midst of this chaos and confusion, running for their lives as the Antichrist is opposing them and seeking to wipe them out, there are going to be those that say, oh no, the Christ is here. Come over and, and come to the secret place. Come to the desert. We'll show you where he is. He said, tell them, don't, don't listen to that. Don't believe that. Those are lies. Verse 26, therefore... If they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. 
Again, this warning is given to those who would be vulnerable to deception and they're panicked and they're running to safety and they're being hunted by the Antichrist. Listen, folks, let me just pause and bring this to us here today. We need to be aware of the ongoing deception that surrounds us. And the best way to be able to defend against deception is just to know the truth is to know the word of God, to stay in the Bible, to stay in the scriptures. And when you know the truth, the truth sets you free. It gives you discernment. You're able to handle what, you know, no, wait a second, that's a lie. I don't, I don't believe that because what I see here is different than what you're saying there. And so knowing the truth helps to insulate you against the lies that are prevalent throughout this world. At the end of this three and a half years, Jesus is going to come again. But it's like, the, if, you could, if you could say it this way, the abomination that brings about desolation is the halfway point. It's the half time. And what follows after is, is, is unbelievable things that come upon the earth. In fact, Jesus then says, don't be deceived. Don't go out there. Don't listen to them. And then he tells you why. Because in verse 27, why should they not go out there in the inner room? Why should they not go out to the desert? Because he says in verse 27, as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. In other words, the second coming is not going to be some hidden event. It's going to be very visible, like lightning flashing from the east to the west. That's how visible it's going to be. Every eye will see him. Not like, is that him out in the desert? No. Every eye is going to see him when he comes back riding on the clouds, the Bible says. Every eye is going to see him in his second coming. So don't be deceived and don't think that he's coming there or he's coming there or he's coming here. No, no, no. You're going to see it. Everybody's going to see it. And he gives this illustration. It's like a, a carcass on the ground and all the birds that surround it. When you see all of it, you're going to know. He's coming. Nobody's going to miss it. Everybody's going to see it, in other words. The second coming is visible. The second coming of Jesus is the climactic moment in the redemptive history of mankind. It's going to be the culmination of everything that God's people have been praying for. The second coming, I'll mention it again is dealt with 1,845 times in the Bible. One out of every 30 verses deal with it or mentions it. Seven out of 10 chapters in the New Testament talk about it. The second coming is mentioned eight times to every one mention of Christ's first coming. Jesus himself talked about his second coming 21 times in his own teaching. It, it's important, obviously. He mentions it over and over. Countless exhortations were given to watch, to pray, to be ready, to prepare. And there is a stark contrast between the first and second coming of Jesus. I mean, when you think about it, the first coming, he rode on a donkey. Why? Because when, when kings come in peace, they ride on donkeys. He came for peace. But in his second coming, he rides a white horse and he comes for war. In his first coming, he comes as the suffering servant. Suffering servant. In his second coming, he comes as king and lord. His first coming, he came in humility and meekness. But in his second coming, he comes with majesty and power and authority. In his first coming, he came to suffer the wrath of God for sinners. In his second coming, he pours out the wrath of God on sinners. In his first coming, he was rejected as the Messiah. But in his second coming, he will be recognized as Lord. His first coming, he came to seek and save the lost. And in his second coming, he will come to judge and rule as king. Let me give you a glimpse of what this second coming looks like. In Revelation 19, John describes it. As he tells us in verse 11, I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true and righteousness. He judges and he makes war. And his eyes, talking about Jesus, his eyes were like a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he will strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And on his robe and on his thigh, 
a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is what the second coming of Jesus Christ looks like, folks. It will be visible and it will also be powerful. Jesus tells us in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon won't give its light, the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Luke gives us a parallel passage in Luke 21 verse 25 and it reads this way. There will be signs in the sun in the moon and in the stars and on the earth, distress of nations. With perplexity, the sea and the waves will be roaring and men's hearts will be failing from fear and expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Jesus said during this leading up to the second coming, there is going to be signs in the heavens. I mean, cataclysmic events unfolding. In fact, Revelation chapter 16 tells us about this. It says in chapter 8 that, or 16 verse 8, that the fourth angel pours out his bowl, that is a bowl judgment on the sun. And the power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with a great heat. But notice the response. It says here, they blaspheme the name of God who has power over these plagues and they did not repent and give him glory. They knew where the judgment was coming from. And yet still, even though they knew it was from God, they still did not repent and chose to blaspheme him. Even after all of this, during this tribulation period. Folks, I don't know if you can think about this for a second, but imagine our sun makes up 99% of the mass of the entire solar system. And the diameter of the sun at its equator is approximately 860,000 miles. It's 109 times that of the earth. It's so large, it's estimated that you could fit 1.3 million earths inside of the sun if it were hollowed out. And the earth is at just the right distance from the sun, 93 million miles away, travel up the speed of light. And at this distance, the earth receives only billionths of the sun's energy every second. If it were any closer, we would fry. If it was any farther away, we would freeze. The sun converts about 5 million tons of its matter into energy every second. That, that's the equivalent of 100 million or 1 megaton hydrogen bombs going off every second. The surface is 5,500 degrees Celsius. The core temperature, 15 million degrees. During the tribulation period, the Lord's just going to allow the sun to scorch people on the earth. And yet they still blaspheme him and do not recognize him even though they know where the judgment is coming from. The moon, it says, won't give its light. The stars are gonna fall from heaven. One star falling from heaven would be enough to wipe out so much. And the powers of heaven will be shaken. And during this time, men's hearts are gonna be failing them for fear of what is happening. In fact, Revelation tells us, Revelation chapter six, verse 16, that they'll be saying to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and the wrath of the Lamb. What follows these cataclysmic events during the great tribulation as this seven years comes to a close will be the second coming of Jesus Christ. Zechariah chapter 14 tells us the location. In Zechariah chapter 14 verse three it says this, then the Lord will go forth and he will fight against those nations. Of course, that is in the Valley of Jezreel. The Battle of Armageddon will take place. But as he fights in the day of battle, and in that day, it says his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from the east to the west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half toward the south. It's interesting when you go to Israel and you actually sit on the Mount of Olives and you look to the East Gate and you imagine while you're sitting there, this thing splitting in two and, and him just putting his foot down and then striking those who are opposed to him there at the Battle of Armageddon as he comes to establish his kingdom. 
Jesus said to his disciples, hey, listen, when you see these things, you need to look up, you need to be aware. To help the disciples understand a little bit further, he uses what he would often do in his teaching, a parable. He gives them an illustration. Some, some kind of picture that takes all of these huge things that we just talked about and makes it simple so you can understand. He uses the example of a fig tree. And he tells us here in verse 32, learn this parable from the fig tree, which there are fig trees everywhere in Israel. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, what does that tell you? Well, he tells us, you know that summer is near, all right? So you also, when you see all of these things, that is what he just described, then know that it's near. It's at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all of these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So Jesus tells his disciples to help you understand, look at these fig trees. They're all around us. When you see the leaves on them, what does that tell you? It tells you summer is coming. So when you see all of these signs in the same way, that tells you it's at the doors. We're close. It's near, in other words. And then he says, the generation will by no means pass away until they see these things take place. What generation was Jesus speaking of? Well, it wasn't the generation of the disciples because they never saw Jesus return in glory as described in Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. It undoubtedly is the generation that sees these signs, the events and Jesus' return. It's not gonna be some thousand year timetable. The generation that is alive when these things take place that Jesus described here, they will see these things. The, the ones that are alive when this happens. They're not gonna pass away until all of these things come to pass. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. I appreciate that. I'm so thankful for that. Jesus is preparing his disciples for what's coming next. He's telling them, answering their question, what they're to look for. And then he goes on further and he takes them back again to the Old Testament in verse 36. And he says, but on that day that he's talking about, that hour, no one knows except the angels in heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the son of man be. Goes back to the book of Genesis now. For as in the days of Noah, before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all the way. That is, they were all judged. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus looks back now to Genesis and he talks about the times of Noah and what was happening during the days of Noah. Violence covered the earth. Every imagination of man's heart was evil continually. Another place Jesus refers to the times of Sodom and Gomorrah, the times when Lot was uh, and his family were there. And he talks about the judgment that will come. It's like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember the days of Noah. Listen, if ever there was a time when we are paralleling what was described in Genesis, I believe it's now. The things that we're seeing now parallel what happened back then. Violence covering the earth. Perversion in every direction, in every form. We need to be aware of these things. Now, when you look at this, Jesus talks about the fact that in the days of Noah, there are gonna be those that aren't ready like they weren't ready then until it rained and then it was too late. They didn't listen. They weren't prepared. And then Jesus goes on to say, notice verse 40. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore. For you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. The nation of Israel, not expecting the return. Now, let me say this. In looking at these verses right here, and I mention it because there has been some differing of opinion. So I bring it to your attention. One group looking at these last verses suggests that Jesus mentioning Noah, that the emphasis is on the fact that people did not know the day or the hour of judgment that was coming in Noah's day. They were going on business as usual, immorality, 
violence, etc. So too, during the tribulation period, these things will be taking place and the judgment of God will be poured out in a moment that men do not expect. That is one way to look at this particular passage. Furthermore, they suggest that when it refers to people, one being taken and the other left, that in this context, answering the questions of the disciples, that it's not talking about the rapture at this moment, but it's talking about one that's taken in judgment and one that's not. That is one particular way to look at this, and the reason being because of the context, because of the questions that are asked, because it's dealing primarily with the nation of Israel. On the other hand, there are some that suggest that this refers more to the rapture. Listen, either way, the overall picture is this, be ready. I mean, watch. This is what we're seeing here. Jesus says in verse 42, watch. And then in verse 44, be ready. Watch, be ready. And then he says, be faithful. Friend, I hope that, I hope that your eyes are open. I hope that you realize, I hope you're not messing around in your relationship with God right now <laughs> in the days in which we're living or any day for that matter. That these, these are real things that are going to come. Some people are just, you know, even some believers just not really living in the moment, present, aware of what's going on around them. Just kind of just, yeah, you know, no big, that's over there. That doesn't touch me. Oh, listen, don't be fooled. I mean, I mean, have your eyes open. Watch, be ready. Live your life as if you were coming today. And then he adds to this, look at this, the final exhortation in light of this, verse 45, who then is a faithful and wise servant. Oh, you want to watch? You want to be ready? But who's faithful? And then he describes what a faithful servant looks like. Whom his master made ruler over his household to give him food in due season. Verse 46, blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, not if, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you, he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant, here's the other side of it. If that evil servant says in his heart, ah, my master delays his coming. And he begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. Then the master of that servant will come one day when he's not looking for him at an hour that he's not aware and he'll cut him in two and appoint him a portion with the hypocrites, the fake, the phony. And there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What a heavy exhortation from Jesus concerning things to come. He's saying, you want to be watching. You don't know. You want to be ready because it comes when you don't expect. And then he said, you want to be faithful. And what does a faithful servant look like? A faithful servant is one who's faithful, one who's working until he comes. He's just laboring, knowing the Lord's coming and he's aware of it. And he's living in light of that fact, faithful. Are, are, are we faithful people to the Lord? Will he find a faithful bride when he comes? That's the question that we need to be asking ourselves. Are we living faithful lives unto the Lord? Or are we being unfaithful? He said, there's some that are ready and they're, they're looking and they're prepared and they're excited about his return and they're living for it. On the other hand, there are those that just think, oh, he's delayed his coming. You know, Christians have been saying he's going to come forever. I was back, you know, 19, whatever. And I remember people saying, this is it. And it wasn't. And then I heard this happen and then it didn't happen then. And then I heard him say this and oh, it's going to happen now. Oh, so there's bombs flying over Israel from Iran. And whoopee. You know, like it's not going to happen. And you just like, you, 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 ignorance is bliss to you. And what you're not seeing is these things, just like Jesus said, are intensifying with frequency and intensity. You're getting closer. So this isn't the time to back off in your relationship with the Lord. This is the time to walk with Jesus, to live for Jesus. He said, this, the servant that's foolish is the one that's going out and partying with his friends and thinking, well, whatever. Just hanging out with drunkards. What are you even doing? You're inebriated to reality. Stop doing that. Get serious about your walk with the Lord is what he's encouraging these guys to do. Be watching, be ready, be faithful. And the promise is those that are faithful are gonna be rewarded. And so I look at this text and I see what Jesus said. And I realize, man, Lord, these things are serious. I mean, how, how incredible is it that today, I mean, what's going on in Israel today in light of where we are right now, it's no accident. The Lord knows. Are we watching? Are we ready? Are we faithful? That, that's what I want to be doing. I want to be doing this because the Lord has revealed it to me in his word. And so folks, I, I pray today that perhaps for some 
It's a wake-up call. Like the Lord has just kind of opened your eyes. The Bible says, awake you who sleep and rise from the dead and Christ will give you life. Allow the scriptures today to penetrate your heart. Allow the, the truth of the prophetic words of God to, to, to captivate your heart, to penetrate your heart, to be planted deep within so that it changes the way that, that you live, that I live. It gives us the right perspective. These are exciting times because folks, listen, <laughs> think about this. We, we could be the generation. That's what's exciting to me. So if you're fearful, if you're worried, if you're anxious, don't be. Jesus said, don't worry. Don't get anxious. Don't be fearful. But instead, be faithful. May God help us to, to live as though he were coming today. Because the fact is he could. <laughs> God help us. Will you pray with me today? Heavenly Father, what timing. <laughs> what timing to be in this place in Scripture, Lord, to be considering these truths that you said will never pass away. Lord, we've seen these things unfolding and they are increasing, just like you said. And the nations that you mentioned so many thousands of years ago, prophetically, are all taking center stage, just like like you said. So Lord, I pray for us as a fellowship, as believers in Christ, that we'd be watching, that we'd be ready, and that we would remain faithful until you come. Not taken by surprise, Lord, but anticipating your arrival. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with us, church? Listen, if you need prayer today, we'd love to pray with you. I would encourage you to come up after the service. Pastors will be up front. But may the Lord give you a beautiful week that you would walk in the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit would be evident in your life. Also pray that God would protect us in the days in which we're living. That we would be lights in the midst of darkness this week experiencing more of his grace, more of his love in Jesus' name. God bless you. We'll see you soon. God bless. Maranatha.